Good day, folks. Professor Fiore here. Today's topic, if you haven't already figured it out, is the snubber diode. Don't you love the name snubber? It's a snubber diode. So what's a snubber diode? What's it used for? Essentially, we have an issue when we use transistors as switches to turn on and off a load. So this might be a very simple kind of thing, right? Like you've got a fan, let's say. You want to turn it on. Sometime later, you want to turn it off. Or in a more advanced uh, application, you might be using pulse width modulation, where we rapidly turn the transistor on and off. In other words, we sort of pulse current through the load to control its speed. Now, with an inductive load like a motor, we have an issue because if you remember, current through an inductor cannot change instantaneously. So when you turn the transistor off, the current that was in the load, the motor, in other words, in the inductor, that can't just disappear. And what will end up happening is that can create a large voltage spike across the transistor, which can blow up the transistor. And of course, it might blow up other things in the circuit as well. Well, you know, generally speaking, blowing things up is not good in your circuits. So we want to avoid that. Essentially, what we're going to do is the snubber diode's purpose is to snub, in other words, clip or clamp, that voltage spike. It does so by allowing for a alternate current path for that current that was set up in the inductive part. All right. Snubbing diodes are also known as flyback diodes, you might hear that term, or clamp diodes, another term you might hear. And that spike is sometimes referred to as an inductive kick. So let's move along and look at a, sort of the starting circuit here, which is a nice resistive load. What we have is a transistor hooked up to essentially a square wave source. I've got a, a, a little zero to five volt, like logic pulse kind of thing coming in here, and it's switching on and off at 10 kilohertz. So most of that voltage, with the exception of you know, a, a base emitter drop, so let's say somewhere in the vicinity of 4.3 volts, is gonna drop across this base resistor, which will produce a little over four mils, and that will be enough in this circuit to drive the transistor into saturation. We only have a 10 volt source with a 100 ohm resistor. So what ends up happening is this 10 volts, ideally, right, the transistor and saturation will be zero. We'll get 10 volts over 100 ohms. All right, that'll give us 100 milliamps. And if you think about it, you know, if you have like four or five milliamps in the base current, uh, you don't need much of a beta. You know, you only need a beta of like, uh, well, what's that going to be? Like a factor of maybe 20 or so, a little over, um, to force this thing into saturation. So that's likely to happen. Now, we're not going to get exactly 10 volts because, again, when the transistor turns on, you know, there might be a tenth or two of a volt across the transistor, but most of this 10 volts is going to sit across the 100 ohm. All right. So let's just verify that with a quick transient analysis. So I'm going to go from 1 to 1 1.2 uh, milliseconds. So we'll get over the initial turn off, or excuse me, turn on. Um, and that'll be enough for us to see at least a couple of cycles. All righty. Bring this down here. And it looks a little busy, so I'll tell you what we're going to do. Let's separate these curves out, and this will be a little easier to see. So the maroon here, right, is VCE. This is the voltage from collector to emitter, or basically collector to ground, because the emitter is grounded. And then the green is the input. So here's our input spike coming in, right? It goes up to five volts, comes back down to zero, back to five, and just keeps repeating. So as we would expect, when this is high, logic high, that's enough to turn the transistor on, right? The transistor voltage basically goes to zero. As a matter of fact, if we look over here, we can see it's going to 200 and, well, just about 229 millivolts. Okay, in other words, a couple tenths of a volt as expected for saturation. And, uh, you know, we'll get an appropriate current. We could insert an ammeter in here, but, you know, we'll get the appropriate current. And when the uh, drive signal goes to zero, what ends up happening? Well, there's no base current, so there's no collector current. There's no drop across this resistance and hence VCE goes up to the power supply. So there we go. We can see it going up to the 10 volts, okay? 
just slightly under, right? This is limiting at 10.09, but it's basically 10 volts, okay? So, now if you're really persnickety about it, get that over there. All right, so we're going up to 10, 10, 10, 10, okay? So, beautiful. Exactly as expected, very well behaved, everybody's happy. Now we turn around and I'm going to throw in an inductive load. Like I said, could be a motor because, you know, there's windings in a motor and that creates inductance. Now you can actually build something like this in lab using a little hobby motor. So you're not going to get exactly the values that I'm going to put down here, but you're going to get, you know, something reflective of this. Okay, so here... I've thrown in a 500 uh, microhenry worth of inductance in series with this. So the thing to remember is that for an inductor, the voltage is the inductance times the rate of change of current with respect to time, right? Now, v is equal to L D I D T. So here's the important thing to remember beyond that. The logical extension of that is that D I D T, the rate of change of current, is equal to V over L. This is why we know it can't change instantaneously. Current cannot change instantaneously. In other words, instantaneously would mean that DIDT could go to infinity, or at least a humongously large value in practical terms. And to do that, for any given value of inductance, L, we would need a humongous value of voltage. Theoretically, we would need an infinite-sized voltage. Well, there is no such thing. So guess what? DIDT cannot jump to infinity, and therefore the current cannot change instantaneously. So what ends up happening here is, when we turn this transistor on, after the initial you know, charge that we get, because there is a reactive element in here, we're going to get 10 volts sitting across the resistor. So we're going to get the 100 milliamps that we expect. But when the drive voltage back here on the base goes to zero, we turn the transistor off, that 100 milliamps has to kind of like go somewhere, right? It just doesn't disappear. But this transistor's off. So what ends up happening? Well, that current through whatever that um, resistance happens to be for the transistor can create an absolutely huge voltage spike. And in fact, most likely will destroy the transistor. Let's go check this out. Of course, the exact size of the spike will depend on your component values out here. So this, this part, you don't actually want to build in lab. In other words, you don't, you don't want to go grab a 500 microhenry uh, coil and a resistor and this transistor and see if it actually blows up, right? That's not really the point here. Because, um, you know, you, that's going to get expensive after a while. All right, so I'm going to run the same exact transient analysis, and we're going to look at the waveforms. Hey, this doesn't look the same. Wow. Right? Look at look at this stuff. I'm going to separate these out again. Okay, so here's my drive voltage as expected, right? Going from 0 to 5. And this is the VCE. Now, I want you to notice this pulse up here. We're getting up to 140 volts. Okay. So, you know, down here, this is the saturation that we saw before. So we are getting our, you know little over two tenths of a volt, right? This is showing up as uh, just about 230 uh, millivolts, right? So that's expected. But then when we turn off, we have this issue with this large current and boom, we get the huge spike, right? So we get the spike over here, you know, over here it's maxing out at uh, 140 volts. Well, you're going to blow up transistor, right? You got 140 volt spike across it, boom. All right, so although, the, although you can do this very nicely in the simulator, you know, in, a, in literally, you know, a millisecond, you're going to have a fried transistor on your hands. Okay? All right, so in comes our hero, wah, 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 the snubbing diode. So what we do is we place this diode across the load. Now notice... Under ordinary circumstances, right, when this is conducting, so when I have a high coming in here on the VN and we get the base current, we turn the transistor around, we get current flow through here, this diode is in reverse bias. So if it's in reverse bias, 
there's no current down through here, right? It's an open. As long as the reverse potential, the ver reverse breakdown is at least as big as the potential that we'd get across the load, which in this case can't be more than 10 volts, um, everything should be fine. All right? And certainly a 914 would do this. It would be fun, just, just fine. But here's the, here's the fun bit. When this input goes zero, right, when it drops to a logic low, when we turn the base current off, turns the transistor off, right, we, had, we still have that 10 volts, roughly 10 volts over 100, 100 ohms, in other words, about 100 milliamps, we still have that flowing the instant we turn this off. So what ends up happening? Well, instead of the drop being plus to minus, right, it's a drop when this is conducting, what ends up happening is that current keeps flowing, right? The current's flowing like this down, th down through the transistor. So we turn, the tran we turn the source down to zero, transistor turns off, that current has to maintain coming down, which means that this now acts as a source. The polarity on this flips, right? That's why we saw the huge positive spike out here, right? This thing becomes a source. So in other words, this end is plus this end is minus, right? Otherwise you wouldn't have gotten a you know, positive 140 volts out of here, okay? Damaging the transistor at VCE. So this becomes a source. Now, in that case, since this is an open, the question is, you know, if this is plus to minus, right? Minus on top, plus on bottom. Look over here and parallel with it is, the, is this diode. That's gonna turn the diode on. So you can imagine the current kind of going like, and I have a little series loop over here, essentially, where this diode can take that current. It'll branch off this way. And of course, you know, eventually there'll be a discharge. It'll be pretty quick, but we'll discharge through the diode. And that prevents that huge potential from blowing up our transistor. All right. Now, what will end up happening is because this is plus to, plus to minus, plus on the bottom. Right. That's what we see on the, on the diode. Right, plus on the bottom, that's going to limit this to 0.7 volts. So, you know, the, the power supply is going ground up 10 volts minus to plus, right? And then over here, it's going to be the same thing, minus to plus. So we're going to get maybe 10.7, 10.8 volts sitting at VCE instead of 140. We should be able to handle 10.7, 10.8. Let's see what we get. Hey, look at that. Okay, we'll separate this out again. You know, these crossing curves get a little confusing looking. I've also thrown in um, an ammeter over here so we can see exactly what's happening. Um, in any case, here's our input, as expected, five volts, right? Coming down to zero, five volts, zero, and so forth. And this middle green, right? This is our VCE. So right in here, we're looking at that little tiny turn on that we have. You know, that two tenths or so, right? And we're showing about 231 millivolts in this case. When we turn it off, boom, here's the current that's flowing through I snub. Notice I have the plus on the meter over here. So this is showing you that the current is, in fact, flowing this way. All right, so we start off there. You know, initially in, in, in this conducting state, there's nothing going through here. Like I said, this is reverse bias diode. So as soon as we do this switch, the current coming out of this inductive load essentially goes this way through here and we see this big spike, right? Still, you know, we were looking at, like I said, nearly 100 milliamps and that's what we're looking at over here. It has that spike and then it's going to die out, right? It's going to do the typical kind of RL uh, discharge that we would expect to see. But as we noted, there's 10 volts here. There's another seven tenths or so across the diode and that's what VCE winds up being. And if we look right here, that's what we're getting, right? It's peaking out over here at 10.8 volts, right? And it just kind of falls back. And uh, once that discharges, right, you can see how this lines up rather nicely. Once that discharges, this is going to go right back to 10. All right. In other words, right around there where the current's dying out, um, we can see that we have, right, 10 volts. Beautiful. So that snubber diode is very effective. We just have to make sure, of course, that it can withstand the current and, like I said, the peak inverse voltage and so forth 
um, that we might get out of this load. And that's going to depend, obviously, on the inductive value and the resistive value and so forth, right? Power supply, um, what we had for a current initially. But this is a very common technique that you will see to prevent these damaging spikes, right? Because what's this connected to? You know, I don't know. I mean, this is, I just have this set up as a, uh, you know, a generic little thing. This might be cascading on to something else. Who knows? But even if it's not, without the snubber, we can have this huge voltage spike and boom, we'll pop that transistor in very, very short order. Okay. So snubbing diode, fun name, useful application. Okay. All right. Hope you learned something from this. Bear this in mind in the future. You know, when you start studying uh, motors and controls, or, um, you know, if you're looking through the uh, microcontroller playlist that I have, there are applications where I'm, you know, turning on a little motor, you know, a fan or something like that, like a boxer fan that you might have in your computer or an equipment rack or something. Um, you know, we program the microcontroller to do that. You're going to see this. You're going to see these little snubbing diodes, flyback diodes, clamp diodes sitting across those motors, right? Even small motors, even something like a little hobby motor, you really need to have that in there, okay? All right, questions, you know what to do. We'll see you next time. Take care.